Let's open our Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 16. If you're visiting with us, we we would love to have a record of your attendance, and we do have a gift for you. If you'll just see Janine out in the lobby, she'll connect you there with that. And uh, I'd love to drop you a note. Here's what we do with our visitors. We don't pester you. We don't bug you. But I drop you a note and a card in the mail, and I'll try to follow that up with a phone call just to say thank you and see if you have any questions about the church, any prayer requests. So um, if you would do that for us, we we promise not to, to bug you and pester you. Uh, we won't sell your name to uh, Trump for president or Biden for president. We promise we won't sell it to any political party. It'll never leave our leave in house here. Act sixteen. We're going to do um, this morning. We're going to do a flyover. Now, let me explain what I want to do this morning. There's so much in Acts chapter sixteen. I think that it behooves us. I think it would be to our advantage to kind of fly over Acts 16 and then sort of touch down a couple of times, just kind of bounce the tires of the plane, look around a little bit, take off again, bounce the plane again, look around, take off. And then next week we're going to come back and land the plane and we're going to dig a little bit deeper into some of these truths and possibly even the next week. So we're going to spend some time in Acts 16, but this morning I want us to kind of fly over Acts 16 and we're going to talk about this subject, God leads us along. God leads us Along. Let's look in verse 6. We'll read uh, beginning in verse 6 through 10. <clears throat> they, that's Paul, Timothy, Silas, and Dr. Luke, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came to Mycenae, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Passing by Mycenae, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. After he'd seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi. You ever heard of the book of Philippians? There you go. There to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city in the district of Macedonia. We stayed in that city for several days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate by the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. A God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. After she and her household were baptized, she urged us, If you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once again, as we were on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She made a large profit for her owners by fortune-telling. As she followed Paul and us, she cried out, These men who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation are the servants of the Most High God. She did this for many days. Paul was greatly annoyed. Turning to the Spirit, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. When her owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, bringing them before the chief magistrates. They said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against them, and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had severely flogged them, they threw them in jail, ordering the jail to guard them carefully, receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks. Let me stop right there, but we'll come back here in just a minute. I like chess. How many of y'all like playing chess? Okay, two of us, three of us, four of us, okay, great. I used to play a lot of chess, and I just sort of got out of the habit. I had friends that I would play with. I would always play chess with Leo. He always beat me. Once in a while, I think he let me beat him just to make me feel better, to keep me in the, engaged in it. But chess, chess is an amazing game. It's like chess on, uh, checkers on steroids. 
Because checkers, you go frontward, backward, that's it. Chess, you can go all over the place. And every piece has a different meaning and can do different things. Uh, I like chess because with chess, you're, you're dealing with the strategy of it. It's never the same game twice. Because the opponents, even if they're the same people, they're approaching it differently. And they're at different skill levels. And you've got different pieces that can do different things. So I like, I like chess and I like playing with people that like chess. I don't like playing with people that are too good because by the time I figure out what they did, it's done. <laughs> and I've lost. But I like a good game of chess where you can kind of focus on the strategy. It's almost like a military kind of thing. One day I was in a game store, one of those stores that has a lot of games, board games and things. And I found this game and I bought it. It's called Chess 4. Chess 4. And it's not chess for two people, it's chess for four people. Now, chess is like this. I'm playing you, you're playing me, right? But chess four, you got four people. The board is bigger. There are four complete sets of chess pieces. And you've got either two teams, like you and I, playing these two people, or it's cutthroat where I'm playing three people. And the board is bigger, and the angles are bigger, and you have to kind of not just watch out for this person. Now, if you're playing teams, you can't talk to your teammate. You can't go, move your rook, move the bishop, your queen's in danger. You can't do any of that. You just have to kind of go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So either you're playing with teams and you're trying to read somebody's mind, or you have three people trying to beat you and you're trying to beat this one and this one and this one. And you can't just look at this person's angles. You have to look at this person's angles. And you're having to try to... Guess what this person's going to do? It's called chess four. If you got three friends that like chess, you ought to go find chess four and play it because it—I mean—it just changes the game. Chess four. So I was looking at that game this week and I thought, what if there was a chess eight? Like, what if there were it was a chess game for eight people? Like the board was so designed so eight people could play, or sixteen, or thirty-two. Or 64, or 100, or 1,000, or a million, or a billion, or seven plus billion people all playing the one game. That's what God deals with every day. Because there are seven plus billion people on this planet that all have an agenda. They all have dreams and goals and aspirations and things they want to do. They all are ha get happy. They all get sad. They all, uh, sometimes they get their way, sometimes they don't get their way. Now, if you add to the seven plus billion people on this planet, now you also have the birds of the air to manage, the fish in the sea, and the animals on the ground. And you have the sun and the moon and the stars, and you have the galaxies and the solar systems, and you have the billions, the tens of billions, maybe hundreds of billions of people in heaven that you're dealing with. You have the angels around the throne. You have angels active on the earth and in the, in the galaxy and the solar system. And you have demons that are trying to destroy what God is doing. You have the devil himself. That's God's job. How many of y'all would like to have God's job? No hands, including mine. I, I, my hands are down. I don't want his job. But that's some kind of an idea of the job he does every second of every day. And God is the only one who can do this. He's the only one that can. And he leads us along. Every one of us. I got, Denver made me a little nervous. He said, I thought he was going to get into my sermon here. Like that, Denver, stop talking about the millions of people because that's where I'm going. But God leads us all along. And I looked at this passage of Scripture and it just kind of jumped out at me that God leads us to places. And we see that. God leads us to people. And we see that. And God leads us through problems. And we see that. I didn't read the scripture about Paul and Silas in jail, how the, the angel freed them and the jailer said, oh, he, he thought they escaped and he was going to have to pay for it with his life. And he, he said, no, no, no. Paul said, no, we're here. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved in your house 
and he got saved that night. They he took Paul and Silas home with him. His whole family got saved. They got baptized. We're going to come back and visit. We're going to drill down on that story later. But you have Paul and Silas in jail, beaten, humiliated, stripped, in pain. But you don't find them complaining. You find them worshiping. Would to God, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but would to God the Christians in America today could look beyond the problems to the problem solver and worship him. I mean, the problems we have today are minuscule to the problems that people have had in, in, in other parts of the world and had in times past. And God is still on the throne. And He doesn't have a cold. He don't have a virus. He's not tired. His eyes aren't bloodshot. He doesn't have bags under His eyes. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. He's got the same power He had when He created the heavens and the earth. So God leads us along. And I want us to kind of walk through this. God leads us along. First of all, He leads us to places. I wanted to say this earlier, but let me go ahead and say this. We serve a God who can see the future clearer than we can see the past. Think about that. We serve a God who sees the future clearer than we see the past. How many of us have selective memory? How many of you have selective memory and you start telling the story and your wife says, no, it didn't happen that way? <laughs> or you start telling the story and your husband says, oh, sweetie, I don't remember that happening at all. You ever, you ever say something to your wife like, I remember when I was dating a teenager, I think I took you to this movie. And, you, and she says, you never took me to that movie. And you start running the film and go, oh, it wasn't her, it was another girl. So, yeah. so our, our memories are not always clear. God's vision, God's knowledge of the future is clearer than our knowledge of the past. And He's the only one that can lead us along. And He leads us to places. One of the things I... I sometimes I miss being younger... Like Friday, I helped my son move a piano. Yeah, when, when, you're, when your kids call you and go, Hey, Dad, uh, can you do me a favor? You, you, you go, sure. Like, what, do you need to borrow some money? Or you need me to take you to the tire store? Yeah, uh, Kayla found a, a piano for free, but we got to go get it. Okay. Well, you know, he's 31 and he's young and strong. And he just hoisted up his end. And I had to pray up my end. I was like, come on now, come on, I can do this. I've moved pianos all my life. I'm a piano player. I've moved pianos. I can do this. And man, I, I was feeling it going home. So there are times where I, I miss being younger and having bigger, stronger legs and having hair to comb and not having to look for my reading glasses to read something. But there are times where I absolutely love this stage of my life. And one of those times is I've got, I've got this running film in my brain that you have. And the older you get, the more film you're accumulating of God's working in your life. The places He's taken you. The people you've known. And it's such a blessing to look back over a half a century of being a Christian. Of thinking about all the places God has taken me. And some places I wanted to go and He wouldn't let me go. You see in verse 6 to 10, they wanted to go, Paul wanted to go to Phrygia and Galatia and the Holy Spirit said, no, I don't want you to go there and preach the gospel. Wow, I thought we were supposed to go to preach the gospel to every creature, but you don't want me to go there. No. So verse 7, well, then we're going to take a detour. We'll go this other way. And, the, and God said, no, I don't want you to go there. I want you to go here. I want you to wait for a minute. And this, you're going to have this vision of this man saying, come over to Macedonia, come over to Philippi and help us. When I was a youth and music director at Hawthorne Baptist Church, this was 1984, Tracy and I, well, I, I really felt like I wanted to be a senior pastor. I'd never been a senior pastor. I'd always been a staff pastor, and I felt like this was what God had for my career going forward that I really wanted to go there. I really felt called. Talked to my senior pastor, my boss. He was very encouraging. He said, well, where do you want to go? I said, I don't know. We're just looking at, I think I'm 
I'm too young for a church to take me. Like, you know, if you're a young guy, churches don't always take you because they think you don't have enough experience and knowledge and you're, you're, you need to season a little bit. So I, was, I knew I wasn't going to find a church that would take me. I'd be a project. You know, they take this young guy, let's just endure him until he grows up a little bit. So my only other option was to start a church. So he said, where do you want to go? I said, I don't know. I started thinking about family. And we have family in Atlanta, but all Tracy's family was in Illinois. And I said, well, let's go somewhere halfway between Illinois and Georgia. So we just picked Lexington, Kentucky. It's a college town. Let's go to Lexington, Kentucky. Let's take a weekend trip. So I took some time off to go take this weekend trip to go scout out Lexington, Kentucky. Right? So we go to Lexington, Kentucky. We check into the hotel. We're going to go get something to eat, come back, get a good night's sleep. And on Saturday and Sunday, we're just going to drive all over town and look to see how many churches there are and colleges and where would we want to live if we came here. Here's the problem. On Friday night, wherever we went to eat dinner, both of us, both of us got food poisoning. (laughs) And we took turns the whole weekend. We never left the Holiday Inn. We took turns laying on the bed or putting our face in a place that was never meant for your face. (laughs) And when we drove home Sunday night, we were sick. I mean, we drove home with, like, throw-up bags in the car. This is more information than you want to hear. (laughs) But I'm telling you, we got home. I said, God does not want me to go to Lexington, Kentucky. (laughs) I've never been within 100 miles of Lexington, Kentucky. Since 1984, I don't care if I ever go visit Lexington, Kentucky. It was obvious to me that God did not want us to go to Lexington, Kentucky. We ended up going to Hinesville, Georgia. We started the church there. It's still there. They built some buildings. They've got some land, and they're doing good work. So we ended up going to Hinesville, Georgia, which is about 45 minutes from Savannah, and that's where we started the church. But I wanted to go to Lexington. That was what I wanted. That's not what God wanted. And we met some of the coolest people in uh, Hinesville, Georgia. I didn't know I didn't know Hinesville was on the map. I didn't even know what it's Fort Stewart. We were we were right outside the gate of Fort Stewart. And all of our church folks, with the exception of a couple of families, were military. And I thoroughly, completely enjoyed being around all of them. They were all new believers, unbelievers that were just investigating whether they wanted God in their life or whether God even existed or not. And I think back to that time. I think back to the first church I ever worked in. Trace and I ever worked in full-time. Calvary Baptist Church in Monroe, Georgia. We still have the church directory from Calvary Baptist Church. We look at it every once in a while to remember the youth group, to remember the choir, to remember the pastor, to remember some of those precious people. A lot of those people now are with the Lord in heaven. Some of them are still on this planet. We are friends on Facebook. But you look at all those places, and I want you to think about this. All the places God has led you, all the places in your life. I want you to rehearse today the places. Maybe go home, turn the TV off, grab a pad and a pencil, a pen. Just start writing down all the places you've been, places you've lived. And then another column, all the people you've known. The people that changed your life. And you didn't even know when you met them they were going to change your life. We have memories of places we've been and people we've known. What we don't have are memories of places we haven't been and people we haven't known. I doubt anybody in this room has ever met a person in in your life and said, that person's going to change my life. You just met him and said, oh, I like him. I like her. Not knowing that that him or that her was going to end up being your spouse. Like, it's, it's, and, and if you're dating people, be really careful of somebody that walks up to you, a total stranger, and says, God just spoke to me that you're going to be my wife. That's just creepy. You need to go find your parents and say, that, that boy's bothering me over there. I mean, you, you don't do that. You just sort of meet... In high school, you meet in college, you meet at work, you kind of meet and go, huh, I really like her. I don't know what it is, but I, I 
something like her. I'd like to go get a hamburger, go bowling or something. Or I really like him. Or you meet somebody at church. And you say, hey, you want to go grab a lunch after church? Yeah. And you have lunch and you find out you got some stuff in common. And you think of it as serendipitous. You know, you think of it as, well, isn't that, wasn't that fortuitous? Wasn't that, what, aren't I lucky? No. There's this giant chess board. And God is the ultimate chess master. And he's moving the pieces because he says, I want you to meet this person who's going to be your lifelong partner, but you're going to have to go there because that's where she is or that's where he is. I have this person that's going to be your best friend for your whole life. You haven't even met them yet. But I want to connect you, so you're going to have to leave that job and go to that job, and you're going to find out that you're going to be a, a, have a work project with that guy or that gal, and you start working together on that project, and you start liking each other, and you go to lunch together, and, and now that's your best friend, and you could not imagine that guy or that gal being a part of your life. God leads us along. God said to Paul, okay, what's wrong with wanting to go preach the gospel? Nothing. Paul said, let's go over there and preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit said, no. I'm going to go to Lexington. It's closer to home. No. Eat this. Blech. Okay. <laughs> got it. I got it. Okay. I, I, I want to... I, I want to meet the... I want to date. I want to meet the person that I think is going to be my... I, I'm looking to get married. I want to settle down. I want to have a life and family and stuff and... You know, God just moves the chess pieces. And in the case of Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy, Paul and Silas found themselves in jail. That's a problem. I don't know if anybody in here, and I don't need to know, please don't volunteer this information out loud. I don't know if anybody in here has ever been locked up. But Paul and Silas were stripped in public, beaten in public dragged into jail, put in stocks, humiliated, and yet you find them praising God and singing worship songs to God. And at that point, they meet this Philippian jailer who is a, who's lost as a ball in high weeds. He doesn't know Jesus from a tree. But the rule in that day was that if a, if a, if a jailer let a prisoner escape, the jailer would have to fulfill the prisoner's sentence. So if a prisoner was on death row and he escaped, the, the, the jailer was on death row. Does that make sense? So this jailer sees the doors open and he's panicking. He's thinking about his wife. He's thinking about his kids. He's thinking about spending the rest of his life in jail. And Paul and Silas says, okay, we're here. We're, we haven't gone anywhere. We haven't gone anywhere. He falls on his knees and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your house. So he went, Paul and Silas went home with him. He told his family the story. They shared the gospel. The whole family got saved. They got baptized that night. Now read the text. We'll come back and visit this. They, they, Paul and Silas baptized that family in the middle of the night at their house. They did not have a baptistry. They did not have a church building. They baptized them. And sometime in the wee hours of the morning, the jailer took Paul and Silas back. And they were back in jail. And then later, they're let out. And I want to talk about that. That's another whole sermon about when they let Paul and Silas out. I want to talk about that because there's some good stuff in there. Now, I want you to look at two other passages. Keep your... your hand or something there, a Kleenex or something in Acts, and go with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. What happens in the book of Acts before Paul and Silas and their team leave to go to the next town is they get a little church started there. They had enough believers to start a church. There was... Lydia, who was a very, very successful businesswoman. Very successful businesswoman. So you had Lydia. Um, 
You had this teenage girl that was possessed of an evil spirit that that demon was cast out of her and she came to faith in Christ. That's two. You had the jailer. That's three. You had his wife. That's four. You had the kids that may be anywhere from three to ten. I don't know how many kids they had. Their family, their extended families, their friends. So Paul had started a church with these people. And he got them grounded. He got them settled. He got them trained a little bit. Identified who's going to be the leader. So you got in this church, you've got this whole family. You got this teenage girl. You got this really successful businesswoman who's got a house big enough for them to meet there. That Paul and Silas and, and Luke and Timothy could come and stay with her for a long time. They, they may have had the church in her house. I don't know. This is, I don't know, but this church was started. Now, look in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. I love this. Paul is writing to them. And by the way, when Paul writes Philippians, he's in jail again. That dude couldn't stay out of jail. But here's what he said. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. Always praying with joy for all of you in, e in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. When I go on missions trips, uh, first time I did this, what I'm fixing to tell you about, first time I did this, I was in uh, Costa Rica. And I couldn't, I knew enough Spanish to say, uh, baño por favor. Like, where's the bathroom? You know. Um, but I was there for two weeks. Uh, no, that time I was, it was my second trip. I was there for a week. And I, I met, I was the worship leader at our church, and I met their worship leader, and we did some worship stuff together. Which, that's a challenge, to play in a, in a band with folks that I don't know what they're saying. So he would come over to my keyboard. I had a keyboard. He had a keyboard. He would just play the notes he wanted me to play in that song. So I'm sitting there, like we're in the worship service. I'm like this. I got my hand on the keyboard. And when it was time, he would go. And I, dun, 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 dun. So, I mean, that's how I participated in worship. Wonderful people. I just couldn't, I didn't know their language. It wasn't their fault. It was my fault. I'm in, their, I'm in Costa Rica. I'm in their home. I don't know their language. But I had an idea, and I've done this with every missions trip I've ever gone on. When I'm saying goodbye to those people, I open my Bible. No, I don't. I'm sorry. I open their Bible. I ask them for their Bible. And I can find Philippians. You know, you can, I, you can see John, Acts, Philippians, Psalms, etc. So I always turn to Philippians 1, verse 3. And I point to it. And I point to them. And they read it. And then I put my hand on my heart. And what I'm saying to them, and they would nod. I mean, I don't care if it's Costa Rica, Peru, Panama. I don't care wherever I've been. I've done this. And they get it. It's like, whenever I think about you, I'm going to thank God for you every time I remember you. And that's what Paul did. He wrote this letter to this church saying, hey, whenever I think about you, I think about Lydia. I think about you. I think about your house. I think about the great meals we had there. Uh, when I think about this teenage girl, sweetheart, I'm thinking about you. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of how you're growing up to be a, a woman of God in a, in a really bad culture. Hey, Jailer, Mrs. Jailer, whatever their names were, I think about you all the time. How are your kids doing? Are they growing okay? Kids healthy? Did that one kid get over stuttering? Is that other kid doing better in school? I thank God every time I remember you. There's, there's one more. It's in Psalms 37. If you'll turn there, and then we'll come back to Acts and kind of wrap up. Psalm 37. It's a great psalm. And I admit to you that for a long time I did not understand this verse. And one day the light just came on for me. Psalm 37, verse 4 and 5. Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you your heart's desires. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will act. Trust in Him, and He will act. 
Take delight in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. I thought, and I've, I've shared this with you, I thought for decades that that meant if I delight myself in God, He'll give me what I want. I really thought that's what it meant. De okay, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Right? So I thought, okay, if I delight in the Lord, He'll let me get that new car. He'll let me have that better job, that nicer house. He'll let me get over the pain in my back or my neck. He'll let me have what I want. That's not what it means. If you delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you the desires you should have. He will give you His desires that He wants you to have in your heart, and then you commit your way to Him and you trust in Him, and He will act. Do you believe the Bible is God's Word? I do. Do you believe God is sovereign? Okay. Sovereignty changes everything. If you think that we're just seven plus billion random chess pieces on a board that just keeps bumping into each other, you don't understand God at all. If you think that your life is one random accident after another serendipitous, serendipitous fortuitous event and that God didn't orchestrate that from start to finish, you don't understand God at all. And when you embrace the idea, if you get your head around that God leads us along, He leads me to the places I'm supposed to go and He keeps me from the places I'm not supposed to go. He leads me to the people He wants me to know and He doesn't lead me to the people that He doesn't want me to know right now. He guides me through the problems of my life. He is there with me through it and He's going to get me through to the other side. He is sovereign over people. Over places. Over problems. There are no accidents with God. Only appointments. Do you believe that? I do. Now, that doesn't mean that the, 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 that the places He leads you won't be hard. That doesn't mean that the people He leads you to won't be difficult. That doesn't mean that the problems He leads you through won't be hard. But He's there with you. And one of the benefits of being an older seasoned saint that's been, been walking with God for a half a century is I can look back now at the places. And I get it. I get it. I didn't get it then. I don't be here. Why am I here? You ever felt like, why am I here? I don't be here. I don't know what... God, why? I don't want to be here, but you're keeping me here. Why are you keeping me here? Well, because I want you there. There's things I need to teach you that you've got to be there to learn it. And when you've learned it, I'll let you go from there to there. But until then, you're going to stay there. I don't want to stay here. <gasps> well, you're staying. Obviously, it's, obviously, you haven't grown up enough. You haven't learned the lesson. So you're going to stay right there until you get the lesson. And when I think you've gotten the lesson, when I think you've sufficiently learned what I want you to learn, I'll move you from there to there to there to there to there. I've lived long enough to see how God has changed my life through people. People. The good ones that I enjoyed and enjoy. The tough ones that I learned lessons from. The people. And I've lived long enough to see God, look back and see God, that He was right in the middle of the problem. He was there. I just didn't feel it at the time. But now I look back and go, wow, God, You so orchestrated every move in that. I can see it. I can see it. Hindsight's twenty twenty. I can look back and go, wow, God, the places You've taken me, the people I've known, and even the problems I've had. I 
I think you know this song. Let's see if you remember this verse of the song. It's called Amazing Grace. You ever heard of it? <laughs> Amazing Grace actually has 12 verses. But I want you to sing this verse with me. And I'll finish the sermon with this. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. His grace has brought me safe thus far and his grace, it will lead me home. Wow. Father, you are so good. You've been so good to guide my life. Every place I've ever been, I can look back and see your hand all over that. Every person I've ever met, I see your hand all over that. I see why you wanted me to know them and what I needed to get from them and what they needed to get from me. And every problem I've had in my life, whether it's self-inflicted or it was a problem you allowed to come in my life to make me stronger and more like you, I thank you for those problems. I can look back now and see your hand at work. I can see your hand at work. And I thank you. So Lord, help us to really embrace that you lead us along that your sovereignty changes everything, that we're not just this random little person on the planet with another seven billion random people, that you have a purpose and a will for, for me. And your will, according to Romans 12, is good and it's acceptable and it's perfect. I just need to delight myself in you, trust in you, and you will act on my behalf. You are on the throne you are just as much God as you were when you created the heavens and the earth. You're on top of our world today, and you're going to be on top of our world tomorrow. And we trust you, and we love you, and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen.